Good evening. Welcome to On Point with Ellen with Unite, where we promote and share with you stories of successful women and men of Fiji, wherever they may be. Tonight, we are joined by entrepreneur and media personality, my friend, Nazia Ali Krishna. Hello, Nazia. Hi. How are you? I'm good, thank it's you. It's really lovely to see you. And by the way, congratulations. Thank you. You got married for the first time. And <laughs> yes. Be finally. the only finally. time. <laughs> and finally, indeed. <laughs> and that was in July last year. Yeah, it's been six months. What's it been like, a newlywed? Um, it's been great. Uh, a little bit of adjusting because I, I'm based in Fiji and he lives in New Zealand. So I have to schedule my time around the time that he's in the country. Yes. So that we get to spend time together. And he, of course, Roy has a very successful soccer career. And how's that been? for the marriage? Um, it's been good. It works out really well for both of us because I have a couple of business running in Fiji and he's traveling a lot for his work so it works out quite well because when he's away I'm in Fiji running my businesses mm. and then when he's back at home uh, normally for a week every month I fly over to Wellington and spend some time with him. That's great because one of the things that um, that's come by your way not that you called for it but you know that Nazi is now in that new category, WAG, W-A-G. <laughs> Tell them what a WAG is. Well, um, I think by definition it's wives and girlfriends of sports, uh, sports personalities. Yes, that's right. And it started in England with the top soccer clubs there. Uh, but you're a, you're a different WAG because um, those <laughs> WAGs, most of them don't work. You're just as glamorous as they are, <laughs> but you don't have the Botox. <laughs> well. Shall we say not yet, or will there ever be Botox? Oh, no, 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 no. I try to keep natural, but uh, <laughs> um, I think I don't really consider myself a typical wag. No, I'm, you're I'm, I'm not. too busy um, uh, just being me, doing my own thing. Um, but I do enjoy going to um, the games. It's really interesting to be there. And with when you do that, and you're sitting with all those other wags, right? How, how do you feel? Uh, <clears throat> It was a little bit of a, an adjustment. They're very lovely. Was it intimidating? Um, I think for the first time because I didn't know what to expect. You know, coming from the Pacific, you don't know what the usual, you know, sort of culture is mm. for for you to be with a sports personality. Um, they were they were quite welcoming, so it was really right. nice for me to to just go there and for them to make me feel like I was part of the the club, even though I wasn't there all the time. Mm. So I, 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 I don't get to hang out as much or go to a lot of activities, but we do go occasionally. Because you are a businesswoman and you have a lot of things to do and your visits are always corporate meetings as opposed to going to makeup and beauty booths. But look, there's <laughs> something I wanted to ask you. It is a well-known fact, you know it, um, that Roy is, is a number of years younger than you are. I'm one of those people who have married a man who is younger than I am. How do you feel about that? Because, you know, for me, there's always a stigma in society. It's always okay for a man of 100 years old or 60 or 70 to marry a woman who is maybe 50, no, sorry, that's not right, 20 years younger than he is, 30, 40 years younger than he is. It seems to be okay for men to do that, but it's never okay or really okay for a woman to marry a younger man. What's your opinion on that? And how does your marriage um, reflect that? I think it's personally for us, it's not even a vector to consider. And it shouldn't be. Uh, <clears throat> but I've, I've, I've been called a cougar <laughs> a few times. An attractive <laughs> cougar? No problems. <laughs> like, I wanted to take it as a compliment. Yes, but, I think you should. Um, yeah, but people tend to say, hey, you are a certain age. Uh, you, you, know, you should start making babies quickly because very soon you won't be able to have children. So that kind of bothers me because I, I got married when we were ready. You know, I just didn't get married for the sake of getting married. I always wanted to marry somebody that I knew that I would spend the rest of my life with. Yes. So he is somebody who I want to spend the rest of my life with. And he's an amazing man. He doesn't pressure me about my age or anything like that. And I think, you know, when we first met, I told him, I said, oh, my God, you're like five years younger than me. And he was like, yeah, what's the problem with that? Yes. You know, so I, I don't think it is a problem for us, but I think... Society often sees that, you know, women should be always, always younger than men. But Roy is a very matured man, and I don't see any problem from my side as well that, uh, you know, that 
he's too young for me. We, yes. we're just well, I really don't think it is an together. issue. It shouldn't be an issue for anybody else. Um, you know, I'm six years older than my husband. Um, but look, we've been together for 30 years. And so, you know, for me, age, color or creed should never be an issue in any relationship. And I'm sure with your experience in life and, you know, you've got such a huge entrepreneurial life that um, you'll be far too busy to think about that. Is there going to be uh, children at any stage? Yes, we'd, we'd love to have children. Oh, that's fantastic. Um, we, we plan to have children at yes. some stage uh, when it happens. Yes. Uh, it's not something I'm sitting here like, okay, I want to have children right now. Because yes, yes. uh, <clears throat> I think when you just let life happen, that's what's the beauty about it, that you are not constantly planning. I plan a mm. lot of things around my life already. I don't want to have to plan to, okay, I have to take this time off to have mm. children and come back. Um, but yeah, it is something that we yes. oh, really that's great. want to have. And, and you're actually from Mbaa, aren't you? Yes, I am. What's from... Mbaa famous for? <laughs> Soccer. Soccer? Oh, good. Oh, yes, of course. I remember that from the old days when I used to live here. <laughs> I, 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 you know, all my brothers played soccer and I was always bullied into being the goalkeeper because right. they all wanted to be strikers because, you know, right. strikers are the star of the team. So, of course, I was always there, you know, trying to <laughs> stop the ball. But, you know, they kind of toughened me up by saying, hey, you're too soft, you know, toughen up. If you want to play with the boys, you have to be tough. Yeah. And so you've, you've lived in Bar for a number of years and then you moved to Suva. Yeah, I, I moved to Suva to come to uni. Yes. Um, I was 18 when I moved to Suva and technically I haven't really moved back. Yes, but, but I, I do. A I of do. Businesses there. Yeah. So when we come back, we will talk some more to Nazia Ali Krishna about her life in Suva after graduating from Bar. See you soon. <laughs> Welcome back. You're with Ellen on On Point. And with me here in the studio is Nazia Ali Krishna. And she has had a most fabulous life with a gorgeous wedding of last year in July to Roy Krishna. But now what we're going to do is talk about her corporate life and what brought her to Suva and what she does now. Because what she does is much more than a lot of us put, do put together. So Nazia, you left bar, you worked at ANZ and then you became a fashion designer with your Mataka label. But first of all, what did you do at ANZ? <coughs> I was working part-time at right. ANZ. Um, I was at the call center, so I was answering phone calls while I was pursuing my degree in journalism and literature and language. So it was a part-time job, which on the days that I didn't have classes, I would work the entire day, you know, covering shift just so that I could make a bit of extra cash uh, for my weekend spending. Right. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, that's, that's what I did. I was um, uh, call center staff. Right. Uh, basically, we worked with people who had queries about their credit card or ATM right. cards, and we would load new companies into the ANZ uh, system. Right. You've come a long way. And when I first met you in 2008, which I think wasn't very far off from uh, when you were uh, at, the, at ANZ, uh, I met you at the Hilton Hotel at the very first Fiji Fashion Week. Oh yeah, <laughs> that was organised by um, my niece Donna Whippy, and you know then, and you uh, were a fashion designer there. And I have to say that I looked up because um, I had come to help Donna. I looked up and I thought, wow, who's that? Because you know you were there with your girlfriend, your friend uh, Alia, yeah. Jan, and you two were just an amazing couple. Peter Norton was a, a fashion designer from Australia and he was one of the first people that was invited to attend that show and he said, you know, Ellen, if you really are thinking about taking that show on, because I discussed it with him the second night, he said, you need to focus on those two girls. They're very glamorous, their clothes are interesting, but they're the kind of people you need to market, um, you know, a, a, such a show as uh, Fiji Fashion Week. Oh, wow. So, <laughs> that, yes, I never told you that. Um, now my head is. <laughs> is getting bigger. Um, <laughs> But, but look, you're not that kind of person. Uh, so, yes, so you became a fashion designer for a while and you focused on your label, which was Mataka. Where, would, where did you think you were going with that label? Um, at that stage, I was very much at the experimental stage. I, I, I thought that I could be a fully fledged designer at some stage, or I still, that, you know, that part of me still hasn't died. Mm -hmm. um, it's just that I found alternative ways to make more income. Mm. Um, I think at that stage it was too young for me to leave everything and focus on growing 
my label. So I did it on the side. So when, even till today, I have people who occasionally message me and say, hey, can yes. you design something? So I, I do something for them. Or when I'm out and about, I meet people who remember me as a designer. They want me to, to design for them. So I just do the one-off piece. Yes. Um, but apart from that, I, I've taken this creative uh, side to my other business, which and is publishing. Yeah. So I've, I've always been interested in, in being creative, mm -hmm. um, whether it was styling or fashion. or I always wanted to take something and make it into like a piece of, uh, like a showpiece. Right, so yes. that, that side of me kind of flourished a bit more in print mm -hmm. when I took Well, you up, did that very um, well because I do remember you were in about three or four Fiji Fashion Weeks as yeah. a designer and your work was absolutely fabulous and I really thought that that's what you were going to concentrate on. So why did you leave fashion and design and where did you go? Because fashion was always sort of like, you know, my side hustle, I call mm. it. Um, while I focused on a career that I studied for and got a regular income with, um, I always thought I would wait for a time when I was ready to leave a comfortable job and because the back then the public were not really keen on buying locally made outfits I think now people are willing to spend money oh, at yes, that time absolutely. it cost so much money to produce something and mm. because you are not going to sell a dress for a hundred dollars and expect somebody to buy it you know it really made no sense you know like financial sense for you to be pursuing um, a fashion design career back then mm. so I, I continued to to work uh, at various organizations after yes. I graduated and you've done quite a number of things I mean you're a serial entrepreneur you have created so many little businesses and uh, you know and, and you, you've been consistent with it and I, I'm really interested in your time with uh, Unifem because you know chronologically that's where you went to after Fashion, um, fashion Week and a, num and a few other things, uh, and then you went into my life. Yeah. Um, in, at Unifem, which is now the United Nations Women, it's been rebranded, hasn't yeah. it? Your role there, and I recorded it here, your role there was um, in equality and political governance and uh, with a particular focus to ensure women um, were, had, had a place in politics yeah. um, actively. So what was that position about? Because I know you've worked in Papua New Guinea and, and all that. Was that a difficult task to do, getting, encouraging women to get into politics? I think it was not a difficult task because I actually enjoyed it. I, I love to inspire other women um, and work with women so that they can you know, come up with the best of themselves so to reach their potential. So working around inspiring women from the Pacific in a way also helped me as a person. So it wasn't just me trying to ensure that they could make it into parliament, but it was more about me being inspired by them. So right. eventually in my career, it did make me change, but I would probably, probably discuss that later. Yes, but when I was... What, <coughs> what happened there was then you actually had political aspirations yourself. Yes. And so what we will do is we're going to take a break here and come back to you with On Point and talk about how Miss Nazia Ali Krishna actually decided to go into politics herself. You're back with us on On Point with Ellen and Nazia. And we were just talking about Nazia's political aspirations before it ended, almost before it started, but not because of uh, any other thing. Uh, other than the fact that you got disqualified for a very good reason. Um, can you expand on that, please, Nazia? And why did you want to go into politics? First of all, what happened and what was your intention? Well, um, it was very technical. My disqualification was very technical. I was in the country every month for the last how many years. But once a month, I, I would visit my husband or I would travel for work, um, working in a you know, like a travel magazine, you obviously have to leave the country to write stories. Um, legally, you can only stand for elections if you have lived in the country for 18 months in the last 24 months, which means for six, for a total of six months, you can't be away. So, so they, they've added every single, the number of days and added it up and it was 
over uh, over the six months. But didn't you do the calculations before? It, it was it. It's almost impossible to get the dates right. right. So obviously, I travel one week, and I so I was thinking, okay, that's one week by right. um, two years. Right. That's it comes to six months yes. exactly. And there were months that I didn't travel at all. So I said, yeah, I'm fine. So right. it was something that you know, kind of. I didn't think was um, an issue, issue until, right. until it became an issue. Now, if you, if uh, if you, if that hadn't happened, um, what do you think might have happened? If you didn't get disqualified, what do you think might have happened uh, in your political, uh, in your dream to become a politician? Obviously, and and what was your dream? Well, my dream is to be in parliament um, to influence change. I, I really want to have an impact, uh, not only for people my age, but for everybody. Being, a, being in the media, you get to see quite a lot of things when mm -hmm. you're out on the field. And as much as trying to write about it or sharing about it online or in the magazines, um, the bigger impact is when you make policies that impact change on yes. the ground. Yes. So that's what I wanted to do. And I think that, that is just like a pause yes. to my political career. Okay. Uh, I will resume it when I can in the next elections, but it didn't mean that I have, you know, like given hope uh, in 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 the people yeah. of this country because I I still help them in any capacity that right. I that I have um, on my everyday work. You Were know? you distressed <coughs> that you didn't get in? That you I didn't think make on the, the cut. <laughs> <laughs> I think that night, to be honest, I was very upset. Right. Um, when I found out, um, and then when the, polit uh, when the public announcement was made, it was, when it was made publicly, I knew I was going to get lots of calls, yes. so I just put my phone on silent and went to sleep, so I didn't have to deal yes. with it, because I knew I would be too overwhelmed, because I had a lot of support on the ground, especially my family and friends who said, you know, like, we want you there. Well, I was one of those <coughs> people. I was definitely very happy I was in Sydney. <laughs> And when I saw your name come up, I thought, well, that's really good. And one of the reasons I thought so was because not only are you intelligent, but your experience is so diverse. And I think as a politician, you cannot have a singular background. You've got to be well-traveled. You've got to be well-read. You've got to be somebody who's interested in the community at large and the world. And, you, and you've worked across all of those. So when then I did hear that you got disqualified, I went, what the heck? And what, you know, how did that happen? <laughs> Why didn't you know this? Because yeah. I suspect that had you qualified, that you definitely would have gone in. You wouldn't be sitting here with me because you'd have been far too busy to talk to me. <laughs> but you're, look, you know, you're a go-getter. Um, you've, you've created so many different businesses, including my life, uh, which you didn't create, sorry, but you took it over and you really made something of it. So there was My Life magazine, which then um, you then got uh, uh, in flight, which is now called Fiji Time. And they're spectacular to read at. I mean, every time I get on that flight, and I'm here in Fiji on a very regular basis, you know, the first thing I bring out, and I wish it were just a weekly thing so I can re be reading something new all the time. So how do you manage to, uh, to manage, you know, to, to organize something like that, run with that, plus all the businesses that you've created along the way? Uh, <clears throat> I've been a believer of chasing dreams and mm. real dreams mm. uh, you know some people will say if you're passionate about something you do it but you also have to be realistic that if you're passionate and are good at it then you pursue it mm. you know um, so I I've always been a journalist and I've always wanted to share my uh, you know to the public a lot of things about what's happening whether it's a news story or whether it's something that's more in-depth or something educational so I thought by working in a magazine, I would o a I'd be able to influence change mm. by, with the stories I write to shed information on, on things that probably are always hidden. Right. So when, when we took on the magazine, um, for the first year, I pursued in growing the magazine. And then eventually, I felt like we could expand. And then um, I, I tried to get the contract for the Fiji right. Airways in-flight magazine. And, and because it. And because we were focusing on travel as well, so I was trying to include many things so people can have um, you know, a taste of yes. what's not only in Fiji but around yes. the world. So I think that gave us a bit of an edge and we got that contract. But I always wanted to grow the business. Yes. So we have this brand name, My Life, 
And then I took the brand and because it resonated with people and I said, if I extended it to other things, I think people will know that the quality and what they get from My Life, the magazine, extends to all these products. Yes. So I ended up <coughs> um, starting a cafe. Uh, yes, and, you did that. You did. And, and uh, the cafe was My basically... My Life Cafe and Bar. Yeah. You've done Launch Lab. You've done Life Residences, a startup start that specializes in interiors, styling and remodeling homes. You've also started up a new place called Future First. And so it's absolutely amazing. I mean, you know, your, your, the platform that you've put out there for you, including just being married, and then secondly, um, you know, starting a baby like most people do when they get <laughs> married. So um, I'm really grateful that you've been able to even spend a few moments with us. What I want to do is I've got a new segment for this show, and it's called Fast Questions. So you have a choice. You can either pick one of two questions in there, or you can answer my five questions in 30 seconds. What would you like to do? Your five questions. Five questions. Yeah, actually, that's a bit scary, that. <laughs> okay, let's go. 30 seconds. What's your favorite food? Chicken. What's your favorite? Who's your favorite person? Roy. Who's your, what was your best film? The Land Has Eyes. Great. Who's your best friend? My husband. And what, do you, what, what would you want to be most in the world? An influencer. That's very good because I think you'll do really, really well at that. And so what I'd like to say to you is congratulations. And I really look forward to having you back on the show again because Thank I you. think this is not, there's not enough time here, of course. <laughs> As you've seen, we've read all of these things that Nazi is up to. You're a really great example for women because you, we are such great jugglers and you are definitely juggling a whole lot of balls <laughs> in that air. <laughs> um, can we not even think about what I just said? <laughs> but look, I'd like to thank you so much for being on point with me this evening. I'm so glad that you could join us. And don't forget to join us again next week at the same time, right here on my TV. So good night. <laughs>